I'm Kristen Oaks White. Thank you for joining us for This Week in Louisiana Agriculture, the only TV show bringing Louisiana farmers and consumers together every week. And this week we're introducing you to the three finalists for the Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation's Young Farmer and Ranchers Achievement Award. Now what is that award you might be asking? It's the award given to a farmer or farm couple under the age of 35 who shows strong leadership, improvement to their operation, and a dedication to feeding and clothing the world. And as always, I must say that I am glad I don't have to decide who the recipient is this year. But our first finalist is located just north of Baton Rouge in the community of Pride, Louisiana. Randall and Erica Cooper are fourth generation farmers who raise beef cattle on the same land that Randall was raised on himself. As Twyla's Carl Wiggers shows us, they are raising their two children in the same way, hoping that one day they'll be the fifth generation and continue growing the family farm. Summer vacation for the Cooper family means it's time for summer school. Today's lesson, repairing a broken bush hog. 25 years ago, Randall was learning from his dad and grandfather the same way that his son, Easton, is today. I mean, A, you always want your kids to be involved and enjoy what you're doing. B, that's the way I did it with my daddy. You know, I followed my daddy's footsteps. And that's how, I mean, over time, you know, yeah, it's just a wrench today, but tomorrow he'll know what to do with that wrench. You know, hopefully, He'll want to keep it going when he gets older. When everything is working, Easton enjoys driving the tractors and doing some of the farm chores while his mom and dad keep a close watch. You know, you take little man there and you put him in a field on the tractor and top of bush hog or clipping, and you can go do something that he can't, such as weld or fix fence or fix the broke down tractor that you put him on another one, you know. And Shelby, she'll, she can help. Like during the winter, whenever I, I'm taking note of which cows are calving, you know, she sometimes, if I don't have my book with me, she can recall a number for me, and then I'll just double check it next time I go out there. Erica handles the errands, the meals, and sometimes is on the tractor too, but she most enjoys working with their beef cattle. The main thing that I do is I get the cows on and off the grass during the winter, and then I keep a record of which cows are having what calves, and and all that. We're running about 350 crossbred mama cow. We got uh, Brangus bulls and Charlay bulls. Twice a year we take a few and put them out for grass fed. People buy them directly from us. That direct to consumer business has really gotten a lot of attention over the past year. Erica says they sold more than they planned thanks to fears of a meat shortage, but there are other factors that play into that market. There was, you know, panic that there was going to be a meat shortage. And then also, people like to know where they're getting their, their meat from. They want to know where it comes from, how it's being raised. We sold what we had to sell pretty quick this year. A cattle herd, keeping hay in the barns, and raising a couple of kids is a lot to manage. Add to that Randall's other career off the farm, that is a service that he says goes hand in hand with farming. Randall is also a full-time firefighter for the East Baton Rouge Fire Department. Both of them you're helping, you know, like on the farm, you're helping and providing them with food and fiber. And at the fire service, you're providing them with medical care or vehicle extrication or firefighting. I try not to think about the dangers too much because not only is it dangerous at the fire department, it's it's dangerous here, you know. The danger on the farm is just part of the challenge of the career, but they say the rewards far outweigh their constant struggle with mother nature and uncertain markets. I mean, for us it's worth it just to watch our children grow up, grow up in this and for us to be able to provide a, a good quality meat for our customers is the reward for us. You know, you look back at the end of the day and say, for the grease part, that tractor was not running. By the end of the day, you got it running. It's ready to go back to work. Watching a baby calf grow from you know birth to be able to look out and say, I raised that from a baby. In Pride, Louisiana, I am Carl Wiggers for This Week in Louisiana Agriculture.
Now to meet our next Louisiana Farm Bureau Young Farmers and Ranchers Achievement Award finalist, we head northeast to East Carroll Parish. That's where 28-year-old Matt Dennis carries on the farming tradition his grandfather started in Sondheimer, Louisiana. Twyla's Avery Davidson shows us how this third-generation farmer is preparing for the next technological generation of agriculture. Engine repair is a family affair at Matt Dennis's farm in East Carroll Parish. He and his father, David, are rebuilding an older John Deere engine. The two do not need to speak as they adjust spacing and tighten bolts. These second and third generation farmers work together like a well-oiled machine. And that's how Matt wants his entire 7,500 acre farm to operate. He started making his farm in Sondheimer more efficient by leveling all of the land. Getting the water off is to me as important as getting water on. And that's kind of where I got my got my start is getting the water off. But that was just the start of a whole lot of changes Dennis made. He changed the way he plants his rows of soybeans and corn so that they all go in one direction from field to field. We have 75 fields roughly and usually you have a different line. You have about four lines per field. So that ends up being a pretty good bit of AB lines and our tractor drivers are from another country. So it's difficult for them to come in and know which lines to select. So I got rid of all that and now we use two AB lines to where they can never be wrong. Driving around his farm, Dennis points out how he's been able to increase planting efficiency by 40%. Everything is perfectly square. All the roads are straight, all the ditches are straight. There's only a couple bayou banks. So whenever autonomous does take off, there's no barriers out here. Did you catch that word? Autonomous. Dennis says he has everything set up for the next big thing in agriculture. Eventually the self-driving tractors will be a big thing. I think that's coming. Our tractors basically drive themselves now. All we do is turn them around on the ends. So that'll be big for us whenever that does happen because labor is so hard to find. But also the, um, the management software, it keeps up with how many gallons of chemical you've used, how much money you've spent in this area. So I don't have to go through and really go through the bills anymore. It's all there for me. And that's really cut out a lot of time and made everything a lot more efficient. If Dennis sounds obsessed with data, well, he kind of is. You know, we're timing everything. If you're on a tractor out here, we're timing your turns. We're timing, timing your passes. We're always watching and there's always ways to improve. And so if you have all that data, you can find where you can improve, where you should improve. And that just really helps you fine tune everything and get it down to exactly how you need it to be. If you're wondering where that comes from, just look at the man working with him on that John Deere engine. My dad raised me very hard, just was always on me, always. I was taught that there's always a better way to do it. No matter how good your way is, there is a better way to do it, and you better figure out how to do that better way. But that does not mean that Dennis has abandoned the past. While he's now primarily a soybean farmer, he wants to get this land back into rice, just like his grandfather did when he moved down to Louisiana. It was in the early 1960s. My granddad was up in Arkansas, and he was farming up there, not doing all that great, and he just all of a sudden came up with a bright scheme that he was going to move to Louisiana and farm rice. And everybody was kind of like, you know, what the heck are you thinking? you gone broke up here. You're going to go down there. You know, what's this about? And he's like, no, I got this. I got this. There's but you already lost your ass up here. You're going to move down there and lose your balls. And that's where we got Lost Ball Farms from. <laughs> but um, it, it worked out and everything's still going good. Going good, just like a well-oiled machine. In East Carroll Parish, I'm Avery Davidson for This Week in Louisiana Agriculture. Now we're wrapping up our series in central Louisiana, where Robert and Rachel Duncan are cattle and soybean farmers. Neil Malasson takes us to Boyce, Louisiana, where new additions to the farm and family make this a fresh start for this young farm couple. Good job. Getting chores done is part of farm life, but Robert Duncan has some help these days. Little Wrigley works to feed the cows who are patiently waiting for their meal. The mix of farm and family is a lifestyle Robert has enjoyed all his life. I was raised in it. I've been, I'm 31. I've been doing this for 31 years, I say. And so, um, you know, there was never not a summer that I, I wasn't here. Duncan operates r, r Farms, which runs about 200 head of cattle, as well as 450 acres of soybeans. In the last few years, we've started pulling off yearlings off to the side and, and keep holding them back and feeding them and butchering them. I don't know, I think this is our going on our fourth year. We started that just as a as a side deal, just trying to get, just trying to make a little more income. Um, you know, there was, a, there was a need for it, there was a market for it, and so we just kind of made, 
took the best of the situation and, and rolled with it. There's always something new on the farm, whether it's their new baby Rawlings or a new way of doing business. You might remember Rachel Duncan's Bayou Petals flower farm from our story with Jennifer Finley. Not being raised on a farm herself, it's part of agriculture that Rachel just fell in love with, even though it's been difficult to maintain through the pandemic. So I had the idea of starting the flower farm. Um, Robert thought it was absolutely crazy when I pitched the idea to him. She had this harebrained idea and I told her it was the dumbest thing in the world. The only reason I got him on board was because I told all of our wife and our friends about it and they were like, yes, Robert, you need to let her do this. It's something different, it's something new. Why not diversify and try something different? Flowers make people happy. They, they bring joy, they bring light, they bring a little love to people's homes. As a young farmer, Robert says farming is always hard, but the past couple of years have been particularly difficult. We were crazy busy. So the flowers did take a little bit of, um, a, a, they kind of went to the back burner for a little while, just while we kind of hit that head on. I've got beans booked and, you know, I've got, I don't know how many bushels of beans booked. I've got beans booked and I hadn't planted a seed yet. Um, that's daily stress and we've got two weeks of rain in the forecast and um, most days are frustrating. A young couple with infants have enough on their hands. When you add in two farm businesses, a pandemic and both unpredictable weather and farm markets, it's a lot. I guarantee you multiple times a week, I walk in and I go, boy, if I could do any other job, you know, a pay something with a steady paycheck that you don't, you, you don't have to worry with it 24 hours a day. I mean, you, there's not a night that I don't go to bed that I'm like, man, I sure hope cows don't get out tonight. The stress of, am I gonna produce enough to be able to meet supply and demand with my customers? Am I gonna be able to produce enough to fill my CSA orders? Competing in the YFNR Achievement Award is not just for the prestige, it's participation in an organization that Duncans have relied upon, a bright spot through all the difficulties. Now, I remember that first Farm Bureau convention in New Orleans that we went to. It was a little nerve wracking because we didn't really know anybody. But as soon as we walked through the doors of that hospitality room, it's like everybody just kind of opened their arms and welcomed us. And it was amazing. All of the producers that we talked to were in Farm Bureau and we met through Farm Bureau. If it wouldn't have been for that, we wouldn't have, you know, we wouldn't have, we would have never been where we are. And so we, we you know, it's the meeting people. It's not what you know, it's who you know. The winner of the 2021 Louisiana Farm Bureau Young Farmers and Ranchers Achievement Award will receive a $35,000 cash prize courtesy of the Southern Farm Bureau Casualty Insurance Company. They will also receive an all-expense paid trip to the 2022 American Farm Bureau Convention in Atlanta, Georgia. The winner will be announced this weekend at the Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation's Young Farmers and Ranchers Business Session on Saturday, June 12th. You can tune in to the live stream for the announcement and we'll link you over to that and much more on our website at twilighttv.org. Well, still to come on Twyla, we feast on some fresh Louisiana alligator in a brand new field to feast. Stay with us. Welcome to Field to Feast, where we profile Louisiana and its local ingredients. This morning, we're talking alligator, artwork, and griots and grits. Field to Feast with Jennifer Finley is brought to you by the Louisiana Crawfish Promotion and Research Board. Louisiana Crawfish, ask before you eat. And by the Louisiana Beef Industry Council. Beef is what's for dinner. And by the Louisiana Rice Promotion Board. Think rice. We're here with Leslie Charleville and we are about to do some incredible artwork. Can you please talk to me about what kind of artwork we're about to see? Yeah, sure. So, um, Many years ago, I started doing an art form called Giotaku. It's a, it's a method of um, getting an impression of a fish or an animal uh, or an alligator in this case, um, where you actually have a rubbing of it, sort of like a leaf rubbing, or some people call it Yes, I remember to, those from like yes. first grade. Yes, yes. Um, so it's basically the same thing, except today we're gonna use an alligator to do it. How in the world did you get into this medium? I mean, it's so creative and exciting. Yeah, so um, I went to LSU in painting and drawing, and I come from a fishing and hunting and outdoor loving family, and it was the perfect collision of those two worlds. Absolutely. Yeah, and um, so once I started, it was there was no stopping. It became an obsession, and uh, today, even more so than it was, you know, 10 years ago, it's 
an obsession. For an alligator, I'll use uh, just a water-based uh, paint. Today I'm using acrylic. I roll it on. There's a line that I try to follow sort of halfway down his body so you don't get this butterfly effect. Right, I see it. Whenever you pull it off. And let's oh, see. Oh, just a little on the tip just of the nose. Just a little. That's right. All right, you grab one end. Yes, ma'am. I'll grab the other end. OK. And all I need you to do is like, we're going to lay it right on top. All set righty. it down, and I got it from here. So I would say the most unusual fish is probably a spoonbill catfish, which is local. I got it. Um, it was actually floating in False River. And a friend of mine saw it and said, there is a weird looking fish in False River. Do you want it? I'm like, absolutely, I do. <laughs> what a great phone call. Yeah. I said, yeah, absolutely. You're the go-to for that. It looks like you're giving the little alligator a massage. I'm next. That is, well, you know, we can do that. <laughs> that is exactly what I'm doing. I'm, I'm kind of fit, fit, finding every little crease and crevice and you know really taking my time to press them a lot of times the first print that you pull is not always the best it just they they get better with each pull okay um but we'll see how this one turns to me this brings back you know my education and my roots and i was a painter that's what my background is at, from lsu and painting and drawing and um but whenever i started printing and really documenting you know, as I like to call it, you know, God's creation. Yes. Then, I, I don't know, I see everything differently now. And yes. I don't want to go back yes. to painting. Because I would paint fish and birds. And I would do a lot of, you know, my own representation of what I thought nature or animals looked like. But whenever I started printing, and you'll see whenever we pull the canvas up, I realized quickly I did not know what any of that looked like. because. Documenting it in this way is completely different than what I thought it was. Look how gorgeous that is. Oh my word. Yeah. Well, Leslie, we are just honored to have been able to spend the day with you. Mm -hmm. Like I said, when you know your passion's coming together, it's like an opening of a, a new gate. And uh, just to have a moment in time with you to, to learn about what you do and to see this firsthand, we really appreciate it. Well, thank you. It's really an honor. I've been looking forward to, to doing this with you guys. and. Um, being able to show people, you know, your audience what it is that, that I do and um, maybe they'll be inspired to go outside and connect with nature and try it themselves. Stay with us because next up we're heading to our good friend Chef Bonanno's house to make some griots and grits. So we're back in the kitchen now with Chef Yvette Bonanno, one of our very bestest friends on Field to Feast. And we have just been doing this alligator art with Leslie. Oh my word, your friend. That was she amazing. Is super talented, amazing. I, I met her three years ago um, when I bought a, a piece from her and we've been friends ever since. So I just had to introduce you to her and just show you her craft because she's She's sensational. Well, thank you so much for bringing us to bringing her to our attention because sure. that was phenomenal. And so now we're in the kitchen with one of our Louisiana local ingredients that we love, alligator. alligator. What are we going to be doing? So I picked up a pound of alligator meat at Tony Seafood. Yes. You're going to find it in the frozen section. It uh, runs about $11 a pound. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're just going to take it and we want to put a rinse on it. So just remove it from the, um, the back and then go ahead and just Put a little cold rinse. And this is local alligator. Yes, and so they're gonna have it year round. And so um, you just, again, where you would find the frozen crawfish, you're gonna find the alligator right next to it. It's kind of fabulous to be able to say, I'm having alligator. Yeah, and it's great for an appetizer starter. So I yes. thought it would be fun to do a, a spin on grits and griots, yes. gator and grits. So picked up Bonacast. They started out local at grit. the Red Stick Mar Farmer's Market. These are coming from the yellow corn. Okay. They're stone ground, so they're not processed. So to that, we're gonna add some butter. <laughs> Once it's down to about 15 minutes, we'll put that cream in there to just give it a little 
like we said, a little fat on the tongue and just make it. Why not? We're having alligator. Like, yeah, it's nice and creamy. So we've got the alligator ready to go, and okay. you can see it's it's in Thicker. pretty much yeah. Okay. The fillets are kind of inconsistent in size, so we want to make sure that while we're blackening it and seasoning, it's the same size. We're going to take some bacon that mm. I've just cut in small little bite size. Everything better with bacon. It truly is, and then we're going to put that in the pan. As you can see, the bacon is getting crispy. Mm -hmm. It's extracted all of its its fat. Mm -hmm. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the bacon and we're just gonna put it into a bowl and reserve it here on the side. Our mushrooms, oh. these are just white button mushrooms. Okay. Certainly use whatever you like. We'll season them, of course, with our salt and pepper. So now that we've got our mushrooms, our okay. onions, salt and pepper, we're gonna deglaze with a little bit of white wine. Oh, look at there, I saved you some. <laughs> A little bit of parsley and green onions is gonna go in to finish it off. And now what we're gonna do is add our bacon back. Okay. Let's take a look at our grits. They're ready to go. I've got our bacon and now let's turn our attention back to the alligator. I've got a cast iron skillet. We're gonna crank it all the way up. I'm gonna go ahead and turn my hood on. Yes. We're about to uh, smoke it up in here. Putting it on a paper towel is gonna to absorb that moisture. Add our blackening seasoning. So to our pan, we're gonna add our oil. Oh, add just a little bit more oil there. There we go. Oh, gosh, grits, bacon, mushrooms, white wine, alligator, seasoning, you name it. This is so Louisiana. And it's gonna to come together very quickly. So as you can see, I'm not touching it. Just. Okay. Let it cook on one side. We're gonna kind of flip it to sear it on the other side and then it's ready to go. Very, very quick cooking method here. To our grits, we're gonna go ahead and we'll kill the heat. Okay. And we're gonna add some cheddar cheese. Just gonna mix that in. Dieting is for the birds. And, and then we're <laughs> gonna pour this on. Oh our my. Our, these are our stone ground local grits from Bonacast. And we're gonna add our bacon and mushroom mixture. Oh my. And to this, excuse me, I'm the just- The main ingredient. This handle is gonna be very hot because yes. it's been- We've gone from artwork to artwork. This is and your then our, art. And then our back and alligator is gonna go right there on top. Oh my goodness gracious, y'all. <laughs> and then we're just gonna finish off with a little bit of parsley and we're ready to eat. Oh my word. You wanna give it a try? I mean, I do. Honest <laughs> to gosh, this might be the best thing I have ever seen. Local ingredients, can't get any better than that. I really do wish that, cheers friend. I really do wish y'all were here to try this with us. I hate to do this by myself, but somebody has to. And it's hot. Mmm. <laughs> mmm. You mm. like? Mmm! <laughs> mmm! <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> this is the best thing I've ever put in my mouth. Period. It's our gator and grits. <laughs> mm. Field to Feast with Jennifer Finley was brought to you by the Louisiana Crawfish Promotion and Research Board. Louisiana Crawfish, ask before you eat. And by the Louisiana Beef Industry Council. Beef, it's what's for dinner. And by the Louisiana Rice Promotion Board. Think rice. Jennifer will have a special Twyla Extra showing the finished artwork that we're going to post online for you soon. And I'm looking forward to seeing how that came out. And I would certainly love to try that dish too. It looked pretty delicious. Well, the season is winding down, but there are still some great deals and availability for crawfish still even in June. In Alexandria, Crawfish Port Incorporated has them for 99 cents a pound live and $3.99 a pound boiled. Riverside Coney Island in Monroe has them for $1.99 a pound live and boiled are going for $3.83 a pound. Davis Seafood in Lafayette has crawfish for $1.47 a pound for live ones and $3.33 a pound to have them boiled and seasoned. As always, check the prices on the Crawfish app or call your local place for both price and availability. These crawfish prices are brought to you by the Louisiana Crawfish Promotion and Research Board, which reminds you to always ask before you eat. 
Well, that does it for this edition of Twyla. Be sure to join us next week when we'll show you how a South Louisiana farmer is bringing back some native grasses to his pastures. Until then, you can watch all of our stories online at twylatv.org and be sure to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram. You can also find all of these stories and more on our YouTube channel, so be sure to subscribe to us and turn on those notifications so you stay up to date with all of our new videos. For all of us here at Twyla, thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again right here next week. Thank you.